Welcome back, everyone, to another instalment of Space This Week, your Monday rundown of all things Starship development news, launch events from the past week, and all the other stories that I think are interesting to discuss. And boy, do I have a lot to talk about, from space station impacts, space station launches, massive new news from the James Webb Space Telescope, and much, much more. This episode is brought to you by Squarespace, the internet's number one website building tool. More on them a little bit later on, but first, let's roll that transition card and talk about Starship. In the wake of the Booster 7 explosion, SpaceX moved their massive Super Heavy back to the build site for extensive inspection and repair. While all of this is going on, we can turn our eyes to Ship 24, which, now I think about it, I think I've sort of neglected talking about this vehicle in the past few videos, what with all the hype around Booster 7 and the Starship Orbital Flight Test. Now here's a cool picture of Ship 24's rollout on the 5th of July, taken by C. Nunes Images. Right now, Ship 24 is at the launch site, and over the past week we've seen it undergo the first stages of its test campaign. I love this photo taken by Nick Antuini, showing Ship 24 roaring to life on the 19th of July. Lab Padre Ray caught this footage on the 20th of July, showing Ship 24 performing a spin prime test of all six of its Raptor engines. Initially we saw the central three Raptors, shortly followed by the three outer vacuum Raptor engines. The test seemed to go well, indeed nothing exploded or anything, which is much better than the spin prime test of Booster 7, which obviously ended like this. <laughs> Granted, the Booster 7 test involved 33 Raptor engines instead of only 6, but it's great to see that Ship 24 pulled this one off anyway. About an hour later, we saw another Ship 24 spin-up test. This looked like it was a repeat of what was done before, and again, everything seemed to stay in one piece, and as far as we're aware, there's no indication that anything went wrong here. I should probably quickly clarify what a spin prime test is, for those that don't know. A spin prime test doesn't involve any ignition, it's basically a test that involves the spin-up of the engine's turbo pumps. Take a look at Ship 24's thermal protection tiles, by the way. There's now very few tiles left to install before the vehicle's thermal protection system is complete, putting us one step closer to that orbital flight test date. So, when static fire? The last time we saw a static fire from a Starship was with Ship 20, and that was ages ago. I wonder if we'll ever get a static fire from Ship 24 of all six Raptors at once, just like what we saw with Ship 20 as depicted in this photo by SpaceX. I'm not sure how necessary this would be, since all six engines would presumably never fire simultaneously during general operation, the three central engines are for atmospheric flight, whereas the larger vacuum Raptors are for, well, flight in the vacuum of space, and I guess the very thin parts of the upper atmosphere. One scenario in which SpaceX might want to use all six simultaneously during a flight would be during a booster anomaly. If all six engines firing together can provide enough thrust to serve as a launch abort system and pull the Starship away from a failing booster, then it might be worth them static firing them together. What do you think? Will we see a six engine static fire from Ship 24? Let me know what you think in the comments below. And hey, while you're down there, don't forget to like and subscribe if you're enjoying the ride so far. It's a free way to show support for what I do here and I always do appreciate it. It. The Starlink V2 satellite loader has been moved to the newly constructed payload integration facility at Starbase. This white box is used to load up the Starships with Starlink V2 satellites. We previously saw it in action loading something into Ship 24 in the high bay, and this is the building where it'll live. And this building has its own bridge crane for lifting and inserting Starlink satellites into the Starlink V2 satellite loader. I love this footage supplied to us by Starship Gazer. Great work there as always. Now over to Booster 7. Inspections and repairs are ongoing at the build site. We saw numerous Raptors removed from the underside of Booster 7. As of the 19th of July, we'd seen at least 13 Raptors removed from the rocket. At this stage, it's unclear what the fate of these Raptors will be. The Booster 7 boom is extremely unlikely to have left absolutely no irreparable damage to at least something. Whether or not the engines can be fixed or if extensive rebuild is going to be required remains to be seen. There's also the slightly morbid take that perhaps the Raptors are being removed so that they can be reinstalled onto Booster 8, with Booster 7 now being deemed written off by SpaceX. So much speculation here that I'm sure will be answered over the next few days or weeks. One way in which we can all together remember the fallen Raptors is by building them a website with Squarespace, the all-in-one platform to create your very own professional website, who have very kindly sponsored today's episode of Space This Week. Trying to build a website without Squarespace always ends up with me crying in the shower, but with Squarespace, well, that's a different story. 
Squarespace is super easy to use. Just tell it what sort of website you want to make, pick from a list of pre-made templates, and then Robert, your father's brother, you're good to go. And don't feel restricted by the templates available. Once you're off, you can customize basically every aspect of them. And the final result isn't just the equivalent of your cousin's Bebo page. Squarespace sites are professional affairs and support sales pages, mail campaigns, and more. If you're a small business owner, graphic designer, musician, estranged Raptor 2 engine, or basically anyone else trying to carve a path in today's modern climate, then you really need a website. And why not make one tailored to exactly what you need, in a breeze, with Squarespace? And you don't even need to pay up front or anything. Just make an account and then get started right away. And then, once you're ready to go live, head to squarespace.com slash to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain using the code MATLOUN. Greg Scott has once again provided us with some absolutely fantastic flyover photos of Starbase, Florida. There's actually quite a lot of new information to learn from these pictures. For starters, take a look at the chopstick catch arms. These are significantly shorter than the ones on the launch tower at Boca Chica. They're about half to two thirds the length. Now, we're not sure exactly why this is, unless SpaceX have made updated calculations with the booster's landing profile and feel that they can be accurate enough to not need as much surface area on the catch arms. I want you to just hold that thought for a second now as we take a look at the tower segments that are coming together. Here we can see four launch tower segments, although one of them was moved to the launch pad shortly after this photo was taken and was stacked onto the launch tower, bringing the tower up to four segments in height. We can also see some general progress being made in these photos of the gigantic high bay foundations, the Star Factory building is quickly coming together, and also we have this fairly innocuous pile of metal. The eagle-eyed among you may know what this is, but for those that don't, these appear to be the components for the base of an entirely different launch tower. But why? Why does SpaceX need another launch tower in Florida? I mean, the original plan was to have at least two at Boca Chica, remember this official SpaceX render that featured in their FAA submissions, but now we're seeing the apparent beginnings of a third tower in Florida. Now here's one wild speculative theory. NASA are already paranoid about an exploding Starship compromising Launchpad 39A, the Falcon 9 Crew Dragon launchpad, as this is currently the only launchpad that NASA have to launch humans to space. This will hopefully change once Starliner is up and running, but that's going to take a little while for now. We've already seen this very overbuilt structure that we think is a water tower that's tactically placed between the Starship pad and the Falcon 9 pad to kind of shield the Falcon pad from any explosive force from the Starship pad. Now, going back to the fact that the Starship launch tower has substantially shorter catch arms than the Boca Chica tower, well, maybe that's because NASA have refused to let SpaceX attempt catching a booster so close to such an important asset. After all, the catch sequence is far more likely to result in explosion compared with the launch sequence. So, Perhaps these arms are purely for stacking the vehicles, and that's why they're so short, and SpaceX are going to build a second tower in Florida with the sole function of catching the rockets, and then they can just transport them to the processing facility or directly back to Pad 39A for reflight. Where will this catch tower go? Well, that's, again, another matter of speculation. But NASA did recently begin clearing Launchpad 34 of environmental contamination, and they did some general cleaning up of the area. Launchpad 34 is the site that NASA used to launch Saturn 1 and 1B rockets, and was also the site of the Apollo 1 tragedy, in which Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chaffee sadly perished in a fire during a launch rehearsal test of Apollo 1. Could this be the site of the catch tower? I mean, probably not. NASA clearing this place out is probably a coincidence, but hey, it's an interesting one at least. As the crow flies, Pad 34 and 39A are about 11 kilometers or 7 miles apart, and the real distance a transported booster would need to take would be significantly longer than this. So, with all that said and done, what do you think? Will SpaceX have to go with a separate launch and separate catch tower, or will they manage to convince NASA to let them catch the rockets at 39A? But hey, that's just a theory, a wild speculative Starship theory. Thanks for watching. Actually, this video isn't done yet, so uh, don't. We're gonna carry on now. Now, SpaceX pulled off another successful Falcon 9 launch on the 22nd of July, the second launch to Starlink Shell 3. We had hoped to see this launch happen one day earlier, but we saw a launch abort less than a minute before liftoff. Luckily, SpaceX are ready to go the very next day, and the Falcon 9 successfully lifted out of a very foggy launch zone, delivering 46 Starlink satellites to Earth orbit. The booster itself touched down on the drone ship Of Course I Still Love You without any problems, wrapping up the fourth total launch for this booster. We had another totally successful special operation from Russia. 
While on a spacewalk at the International Space Station, Russian cosmonaut Oleg Artemyev deployed a CubeSat by hand, which ended up impacting the station's solar arrays twice. The impact wasn't on video, but we did get narration from Oleg about it, stating that he thinks it's okay because the first contact was very mild and the second contact was at the frame. Oh, it touched the battery. Touched it another time. That's the last contact. He did then add that the next satellite they deploy should probably follow a slightly different trajectory to avoid hitting the solar arrays again. The next satellite needs to be sent at a somewhat different trajectory. And I must say that I think I agree with him on this one. Now over in Utah on the 21st of July, NASA and Northrop Grumman conducted a full-scale flight support booster static fire test at the Northrop Grumman test facility. This is one of the two boosters that will power the massive SLS rocket, however this particular booster does have a few upgrades over the current SLS boosters. The boosters slated for use in the first eight Artemis missions use a substantial amount of legacy hardware from the Space Shuttle program. This particular ground test booster sports a brand new ignition sequence, new steering system and some new materials. NASA hopes to obtain data from this static fire that will help improve their booster design for future missions and hopefully this test gave them everything they needed. Now, we had a very exciting launch over in China last week. On the 24th of July, we saw the launch of a massive Long March 5B. The rocket was carrying the Wentian, which is China's modular Tiangong Space Station's laboratory module. This new module will provide additional navigation avionics, propulsion and orientation control that'll serve as backup functions for the Tianhe core module. This is the first of two laboratory cabin modules for the space station. The second module is expected to launch at some point this October. The week's launch calendar closed off with another SpaceX launch on Sunday. This was another Starlink mission where we saw a Falcon 9 launch 53 Starlink satellites to low Earth orbit from Pad 39A at the Kennedy Space Center. The first stage successfully touched down on the drone ship a short fall of Gravitas, bringing an end to this particular Falcon 9 booster's eighth overall flight. And just look at that beautiful uninterrupted shot we got of the landing. I do love the power of Starlink that gives us these uninterrupted views. More news from the James Webb Space Telescope now. Mere days after commencing its scientific mission, the telescope smashed another new record. It has captured the oldest galaxy ever observed beating the previous by nearly 100 million years. This is the Glass Z13 galaxy, and it dates back to just 300 million years after the Big Bang, which is like only a few seconds when talking about universe scale. The galaxy has a mass equivalent of 1 billion suns and is markedly smaller than our own Milky Way galaxy, which measures 100,000 light years across dwarfing the mere 1,600 light year wide galaxy Glass Z13. Because of the fact that it takes time for light from these galaxies to reach us, the photo that you're looking at right now shows our universe at just 300 million years old, which is crazy to think about. Scientists think that during the course of the James Webb Telescope's mission, we'll be able to see even further back in time, possibly as far as only 200 million years post Big Bang. Now, big thanks are due to the people on screen. They're my generous Patreon supporters and YouTube channel members, and it's their contributions that make all of this possible. If you want to sign up using the links below or on screen, then I always hugely appreciate your generosity. There are also two video suggestions there that the algorithm thinks you'll like. Hopefully it picks some good ones. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you all next time.